As time passes and I slowly get closer to my death, I can't help but see the importance of determining the value of something and if it's worth taking my time. For instance, making videos is important to me and being able to share my thoughts and passions is something that I make sure to put my time into. Being with friends and family is another piece of my life I prefer to put my time into. And then lastly, I have things that I have to put my time into, like work, chores, and errands. And I'm not a full-time YouTuber yet. So with that being said, this is still a hobby for me. This is still something that doesn't make money. So <laughs> I have to still provide for my wife, my cat, and I. And then while looking at the clock and knowing I still have to sleep, I am left with only a short bit of time which is a commodity I can't afford to waste. This time is spent doing what I like to call disassociating. That could be things like listening to music, watching movies, reading a book, or in today's video, gaming. As I have mentioned in previous gaming video essays, playing video games is something I've leaned on for a good time. Whether it's a single player adventure or a multiplayer game night with the lads, it always brings me happiness and makes that remaining time that I have feel well spent. But within the last six or seven years, I've invested time and money into games made by AAA game studios only to be let down and wondering why I even decided to spend my money on them. Here's a list of some games that I purchased within the last six or seven years that I've personally regretted buying. And I'm also including games that I paid a subscription service for. Final Fantasy VII Remaster, Call of Duty Cold War, Cyberpunk 2077, Fallout 76, WWE 2K20 and 21, Starfield, Back for Blood, Halo Infinite, and Sea of Thieves. There's probably a lot more that I'm not even thinking of. Um, I'm actually, I'm actually thinking of some more now, but that's just, that's a big list already right there. And that was a lot of money that I put into these games just to be upset. Now, what upset me about these games wasn't the bugs or the glitches because I understand that these game developers have deadlines that they are not making. They have requirements they have to make. Bugs are gonna happen. That's why patches are brought out whenever those games are released. That is not something that they can you know, control. And I, I commend that they, they do what they can you know, before it gets released. My problem lies with two main things, price versus product and a commonality that I'm gonna kind of go into a little bit later in the video. Stick around for that and make sure you subscribe. As games progressively become more advanced with their graphics and their expansive worlds, they require more money to complete. And because of this, the prices of games have increased. But that's it. They are adding extra features to these experiences that make you ooh and aw and marvel at the work that they've done. They are selling shiny maracas with intricate details, but if we're getting to add the beads, that make it a maraca. In my GTA video, which you should watch, I said you could have an expansive world. You can have a big map, but what's the point of it if you're not adding details and stuff into that world? It's pointless. I will pay $70 for a great game that keeps me engaged with a rich narrative, compelling characters, and fun gameplay. I will not pay for a reskinned two gate too, too gay. <laughs> I will not play. <laughs> what I will not pay for though is a reskinned 2K game that just came out last year. I'm looking at you, WWE 2K, specifically for that because as a fan of the previous wrestling games, what's what's happening? Like, did you just give up on creativity at at all? Like, totally? We do not need good graphics. We need good gameplay. For example, let's look at the FPS genre. Battlefield is one of those game series that I fell in love with when I was younger. I would play these games all the time. And for my generation, I would say Battlefield Bad Company 2 or Battlefield 3 takes the cake as the best games. Or should I say the, the peak of what they put out? Because if I look at the last game to come out in this franchise, I see nothing but a bare bones trash ass game that they expect us to buy and it's see, oh, it's new, it's different. No, it's not. And let's use my earlier argument about the whole, how cost of games go into graphics and expansive maps. Take a look at this Battlefield 2042 gameplay. I mean, it does look great, but it's Battlefield 3. I'm not even showing you Battlefield 2042. That's not much of a difference. 
here is what Battlefield 2042 looks like. I don't really see a difference in the in these two games. And you're and I'm paying more for this? Folks, if you're wanting a sandbox shooter that's giving you the same experience that you had from Battlefield Bad Company 2, Battlefield 3, Battlefield 4, do not buy the latest title of the of Battlefield. Instead, you should put your money into Battlefield Remastered. It's the same sandbox shooter. It is looking like a Roblox game. Focuses on the gameplay and gunfights. And then takes it up a notch more by giving you proximity chat to not just your teammates, your squad mates, but your enemies too. I had a blast playing this game. And to know that it was only made by a small team really goes to show that, again, you don't need good graphics. You need good gameplay. My second complaint comes in the form of a trend that seeped its way into every single game that comes out these days that is a AAA title. Gaming developers have somehow been hyper fixated on the idea that in order to give their players an immersive and enjoyable experience, they need to give us an open world for us to traverse. And I disagree. When you add an open world into your game, you are implying that there is something big that's going to go on in this world. That we are going to be traversing this entire map and doing things in this world that's major. That also, there's things to explore, things to do in this world. But that's not the case at all. When I load into these open world games, I'm presented with a main story mission that's scattered across the map. And then we get dozens of mini objectives that are all most likely going to be the same thing, just in a repeated pattern on a different side of the map. And then to kind of follow up on my Moroccan analogy from earlier, I'm going to go and kind of tweak it to the, what the setting is. You know, <laughs> you could have a Morocco that's large. It's, in your mind, you see this large Morocco, you expect it to make a lot of sound. But what if it only has two beads in it? It's not going to do much. It's pointless. In my opinion, this applies to almost every open world title that is out today, including games that need to have a large setting. Tell me you had fun playing Starfield. Tell me right now that you did. You didn't. And loading up into your ship, slowly getting to get up into space, just to go from one planet, have to load up and go to another planet was fun. It wasn't. It sucked. It was boy. I, I hated Starfield and I'm a big Bethesda fan. I, I Starfield sucked. So, so instead of giving us these large worlds in every single title, let's just scale down the size of the world and focus on a narrative and characters that are memorable and give us gameplay that's immersive and challenging. Now, I am going to go against my one thing, my rule about the open worlds, and I'm going to give one game the excuse, the pass, and that's Elden Ring. As I've mentioned earlier, my time is very limited these days, and my one wish would be that I would, could be able to sit down and experience this game, as to me it seems like one of the most engaging games that I've seen in a while, and it's an open world, and there's, it looks like there's tons to do. It almost seems like the perfect open world game. So what you need to do is subscribe to this channel so I can eventually do that. I want to do that. So it's over here. Hit it now. Please, thank you. To wrap this up, I am very critical of large game companies. And I feel like I have the right to do that as, again, they're large game companies. Um, obviously, again, like I said, I can't handle the bugs that are going to be dealing with. But the creativity... You have a lot of people on your staff that can be creative. Let's get creative. But on the flip side, all these AAA games that have been having issues and all that, this has allowed myself and you know in particular to really get the light shined. I don't even know if that's the right way to use that word. I'm gonna use it anyways. Let the light shine down on indie games. It's been a really nice, fresh breath of air for myself seeing myself get to experience games like Lethal Company, Cult of the Lamb, and I haven't got to play this game yet, but I want to, I really do want to play this, which is Pizza Tower. Getting to see these games, you know, get the limelight as these same big publishers, and in some cases be one of the top games on the Steam list above a game like Elden Ring, 
it's been awesome to see. I have put way too many hours into Lethal Company. It's been a lot of fun being able to play that game with my friends, as well as try my hardest not to be scared of spiders or ghost girls, um, especially in a dark hallway. And what's most important about these games is they're not trying to be a large scale game. They're not trying to be the most graphically advanced or have the biggest map size. They're just focusing on being creative, having a fun game, having a just focusing on the gameplay and not worried about how cool does it look? How big is the map? What can we, what can your people do for a hundred hours in this game? And that sounds like something I could put my time into. So let me know what you think about AAA games. Do you love them? Do you hate them? Do you have a favorite? Do you have a least favorite? Or are you an indie game kind of person? Do you prefer to display the indie games? Let me know. And as always, I'm Timbo. And I just talked about that. Peace.